From the moment we're conceived, something terrible starts to happen. Something irreversible. Something which will shape our every thought, every feeling, every action. And it's called ageing. But how does it affect the key decisions in our lives? What impact does it have on our relationships with others? And why does it influence the way we see the world? To find out, we went in search of 30 New Zealanders aged between 18 and 70 and asked them to be the human guinea pigs in a series of social experiments. And over the next five weeks, they'll be tested on everything. Ah! From how they handle hangovers. Yeah, I can drink a, a bucket load. To how they think they can be the next Sam Morgan. I would like to open the globe on Vulcan. Hal will even tell you who has the most sex. Oh, my God! Why did you ask me that? <laughs> Analyzing their every move will be our experts in ageing. I think all generations lie. The generations. Well, of course I'm going to say that the millennials have the perfect attitude at the perfect age. And psychology. You could also be totally outrageous when you're young and then full-blown conservative when you're older because suddenly you see the light. So we can find out how age affects our intelligence, our chances of success, how it changes the body and, of course, the answer to the big question. What is the perfect age? Well, I used to be a total loser and then I got my PT cruiser. Now all the girls want me to take them home. I'm 17, feels so strange. My parents said it all would change. They lied to me, they lied to me, they lied. Senior year feels so queer. They all said this would be my year. They lied to me, they lied to me, they lied. Ever wondered why teenagers sleep so much? Why old people can't handle an ounce of stress? Come on! Or why at 30 you can't stay out drinking all night like you used to? The short answer is we're just acting our age. So if you think you're a true individual, chances are you're just a product of the times. But then again, maybe it's all just psychological. To discover the truth, we found 30 people aged between 18 and 70 who are typical of their generation. We have the Millennials, born between 1978 and 94, who naturally would like to change the world. Also known as Generation Y, they are text savvy, ambitious, and most annoyingly of all, they've got self-esteem on steroids. They can't even go to the toilet without texting five of their friends, and they never failed anything at school. Make no mistake, this is the nurtured generation. I'm um, helping manage um, a coffee company that I work for. Well, I was in the North Shore Youth Council. Yeah, I was like the head prefect of my school, which was quite an achievement, I thought. I think my determination is a real my strength because I don't give up. Next. Generation X, born between 1963 and 77. They say as far as success goes, anything is possible. As long as you throw enough money at it. They are reckless and non-committal. As a rule, these X's are known as a pretty cynical bunch, but they are assertive, intelligent, and let's face it, tomorrow's leaders. I mean, it's easy to, to say, oh, now I'll still with my safe little job in my office, but I'm not that type of person. Stepping on the top of cars when I was a teenager. Drunk on Mekong whiskey, doing wheel stands in uh, Chiang Mai uh, with the locals. You know yourself better, you know what you want, you've made all your mistakes. You, you know you're ready, you're ready for whatever's coming next. Then there's the baby boomers, born between 1946 and 62, and their mantra is simple. It's all about me! This lot partied through the 60s. They're the rebels, they tell us. Though these days, they're likely to change the system from within. Yeah, right. A generation known for equating self-worth with career success, so it's no surprise that 40% of baby boomers are now divorced. My worst year was uh, 1984, um, around about December. That's when my wife said to me that um, we were no longer in a relationship. 
the worst year would have been 2002 when my marriage broke up. Mm -hmm. Still married? No. Are you married again now? Or? No. No. No, not, not, not interested. And finally, the silent generation, born between 1930 and 45. To them, success is all about working hard and... Well, actually, that's about it. Sometimes called the builders, or lovingly, the rotary generation. They're cautious, conservative, and for the most part, unadventurous. Remember, though, these old times have lived through a depression and a world war. So challenging the status quo is not exactly their thing. What is the wildest thing you've ever done? <laughs> well, I haven't bungee jumped because I take my heights. Builders, boomers, X's, Y's, dot coms, millennials, the silent generation, we're talking about labels. Don't get too caught up in them, but understand this. You see the world differently based on when you were born. Which brings us to experiment number one. What does your driving say about you? After all, what better way to find out someone's true nature than by putting them behind the wheel? And while our guinea pigs think we'll be noting every gear change, what's really going on is an attitude test. Only they won't be driving this $350,000 Lamborghini. Instead, they'll be driving a Ford Fiesta in a slalom challenge. Dodge the cones, make a U-turn, and get back to the finish line all as fast as humanly possible. So without further ado, let's meet the guinea pigs. Starting with 22-year-old Adam Stevenson, a musician with no shortage of confidence. This is my car. It's a 95 Opel Astra, and uh, I believe it's the fastest car in the world. Well, as you can see, she's not in tip-top condition, but as a musician, you know, neither am I. It's purely a utility vehicle for me. It gets me from A to B. And, um, you know, what does my car say about me? I'm uh, basically not into flash cars. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, I'd rate my driving at 6.25. And without a doubt, that kind of confidence will mean a quick time down the track. a typical millennial. He's got self-esteem on steroids and thinks there's nothing potentially bad that could happen to his life because if you think about it, probably nothing really has. It's a 20.25. I, I don't know, if someone like kind of over 60 would go through that fast, I'd, I'd give them a, a, a nice wee pat on the back. And he might just get the chance. Meet 66-year-old Pat, a self-confessed perfectionist who would like to be more confident and more adventurous. This is my car and it's a Honda Jazz. As you can see, it's clean and tidy. It's a very economical car. What it says about me, that's what I'm like. Tidy, hopefully not as yellow. As far as my driving skills go, on a scale of one to 10, with one being the poorest, I would rate myself as an eight. Three, two, one, go. Of course the silent generation drive conservative and cautious, but in fact it's not just the way they drive. Their whole life has been built around being quite cautious and structured. You've got to remember these guys went through World War, uh, major wars like Vietnam, they've, they've seen recession, a couple of them in fact. Change down. For pet taking risks means going on a TV show and driving slalom full stop, never mind the speed. 31.75. I'm feeling quite um, exhilarated. It was quite a challenge. I've never done anything like that before. It was really good. Mm. They've always, you know, been thinking about a rainy day, not wanting to take too many risks, and their driving just reflects that attitude. So what I'd like to know is, are we doomed to get more conservative as we get older? And if so, what's the perfect age to vote national? 
As we age, we tend to become more cynical. And having a family also means we'll consider most issues from a viewpoint of, how will this affect my children? So when it comes to politics, the majority of us support the Liberal parties. That is until we hit 55. And then we're most likely to vote either National or New Zealand First. Though whatever our age, it seems most of us still don't trust politicians at all, especially Gen X. No surprises there. As a Generation X and Baby Boomer hit the track, we ask, how does age affect the way we see ourselves? <laughs> when can I go again? And how we think. I need to, uh, obviously need to slow down. So far in our attitude test, we've found the testosterone of a boy racer is actually a very common trait of any millennial. Thinks there's nothing potentially bad that could happen to his life because if you think about it, probably nothing really has. And that the silent generation are the complete opposite. For pet taking risks means going on a TV show and driving slalom full stop, never mind the speed. Next, we have 36-year-old Louise Rose, a former flight attendant who, despite her outgoing nature, has a morbid fear of kittens. This is CJ. I always name my cars. He's a Citroen Zara. Well, he's red, which is passionate, sporty, youthful and good-looking, just like me. <laughs> I'd give myself a 9.5 out of 10 for my driving, because there's always room for improvement. Go! I think Louise was holding on to a little bit of her youth when she got in there behind that wheel. Let's face it, the X's aren't that much older than the millennials, so they, they do have some of that, you know, modern kind of view of the world. Ah! When they say entered the workforce and left education, things weren't as rosy as they perhaps hoped they would be, and maybe they're just getting a bit back now. 26.15. They did the same with the iPod. I mean, most of the people that bought iPods in New Zealand were Gen Xs desperately holding on to their youth, and maybe Louise was just reflecting that behind the wheel. <sighs> that was awesome. But well, I'm a Westie from way back, and obviously it's in my blood. <laughs> when can I go again? <laughs> Last but not least, meet 57-year-old Alan Reeves, a former teacher and successful businessman. His latest venture, a dating agency. This is my car. It's a Mitsubishi Challenger four-wheel drive. This is my work vehicle. It's very reliable and dependable, very much like myself. And it's also very versatile, which basically sums me up. On a scale of one to 10, with one being poor, I'd rate my driving at eight and a half. Go. Though we're thinking actions speak a lot louder than words. Four point three five. One knocked over cone. One damaged car. I, I, I need to uh, obviously need to slow down. Yeah. thought I thought Alan's behaviour had no reflection on the generation like the baby boomers at all. I just thought Alan was a really bad driver and had no kind of understanding about how to make it work. Yeah, I've got some bad news for you. I, I run these sort of slalom contests a lot, yeah. probably once a week, and you're the first person that's ever clouded the barrier. <laughs> and oh, I've got to yeah. say, you're the least remorseful looking person <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> Some people say the baby boomers have shown that same lack of remorse to the environment, to, to social infrastructure and all sorts of things because essentially they've been labelled the me generation. And perhaps Alan's behaviour on the track was just a reflection of him thinking the, the world pretty much revolved around him. While the Ford Fiesta is looking a little worse for wear, denting Alan's confidence is slightly harder to do. Which begs the question, how does age affect the way we see ourselves? 
based on evolution when we're in our 20s life's all about getting to know ourselves searching and looking for the meaning of life in your 30s life's focus is pretty much on creating your nest establishing your career settling down and having babies in your 40s life's all about establishing your power base your dominance your wealth and bringing up the next generation in a way that you can start to see a part of you will continue in your 50s the focus shifts slowly towards collecting safety nets for your retirement and you start to notice signs of aging in our 60s, the body, as well as most parts of society, want you to take things a little slower. Typically, this is the time to focus on health, grandkids, and starting a new life now you've retired. Or you could defy the odds like our friend Alan and take the advice of Jim Buffett. I'm growing older, but not up. But getting back to business, it's time for the second and final round of our attitude test, which once again on the surface looks like something completely different. I think I'll be sweet, yeah. I'm feeling really good and looking forward to it. My biggest concern is that I'll hit the boxes. Our guinea pigs must head towards the Tower of Boxes at 60 k's, then turn either left or right depending on the green light. But what we really want to know is how the different generations react to uncertainty. While Adam and Louise rip through this exercise without a hitch, it's not so straightforward for our over 50s. Pat's so worried about getting it right, she forgets to even look at the green light. I went the wrong way. Oh! Did I? The green... The, oh, I saw the green the light! Oh! Well, I didn't do it. I went to the wrong side. I just thought I saw the green, the reflection of the green on the um, bulb, and I thought that was it. I didn't see the other side, to be honest. Pat wouldn't be used to the rate of change of modern life, and when you deliberately put her in a situation where she's going to have to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty, she's going to revert back to what she knows best. Planned, pre-thought-out decision-making. And I would suggest to you that Pat's probably like that in most areas of her life, as would a lot of her generation be. OK, call an ambulance. It's Alan's turn. I've just taken a little while to get over uh, my original uh, sin of, uh, you know, denting the car, but... Uh... I'm sure I'll be fine this time. After that, it's up to you. I'm fine. I, I, I didn't see the lights, though. So, uh, I think I failed. So, apart from Alan being a danger to society, what else have we learned? Normally, you would think that someone in their 40s or 50s is pretty well in tune with his or her skills and abilities, and underestimating of those wouldn't occur. Sometimes you can consider it a Teflon personality. It hits you, you say, oops. It slides off and you go and give it another go. That's what our baby boomers are quite often. And while this experiment was more about the guinea pig's attitude than the gear change, what we can tell you is that for speed it was the millennials and for skill it was Gen X who did the best. So, there you go. And now we know who we are, what about sex? <laughs> if you ask a chick for a passion and she says no, you're just going to be like, oh, okay, sweet as, I'll find someone else to, you know, play with their tongue. <laughs> About because we're out at our most easily influenced in the first, you know, 20 years of our lives. And so far we've established those influences play a big part in the way we act and think, especially from behind the wheel of a Ford Fiesta with the exception of one. So, now it's time to see how they relate to one another. To find that out, we went to a dating agency. The objective, to see how six single strangers in their 20s, 40s and 60s get to know each other. 
Meanwhile, back at the lab, our guinea pigs must endure watching each of the age groups looking for love, which should tell us two things. First, how we relate to people our own age, and second, how we relate to people who aren't. Sure enough, from that first drink onward, it was pretty clear there's a marked difference between the generations. First, we have the millennials, who, as it turns out, are really fun at parties. Guys, what sort of food do we feel like? Yeah. I haven't really looked at the menu um, yet, but... I was thinking of just getting a couple of pizzas, all right, and we all just <laughs> go for it, eh? <laughs> <laughs> As for the baby boomers, let's just say their party is taking a while to get started. Albert, Albert, Kerry, Kerry, please meet you. Hi, Kerry, Kristen. Please meet you. I'm running out of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's the silent generation, who are a lot more fun than you might think. Here's to a nice evening. <laughs> I mean, how? Only two drinks in, and the so-called conservative bunch have started talking about sex. Now, you know what they say? It couldn't be more. No, what do they say? A red hat. A red hat, no knickers. Mm. Which begs the question, why is the thought of older people having sex not a pleasant one? No offence, guys. Well, the short answer is, like it or not, we equate beauty to youth, thanks to the thousands of images we're subjected to every day. And while people over the age of 35 are having sex the most, 65% of 70-year-olds are still sexually active and managing to get jiggy with it on average once a week. So maybe the problem is psychological. According to the likes of Freud and Jung, the thought of our parents having sex is only horrible because it reminds us that on a subconscious level we actually fancy either mum or dad. Back at the restaurant, sex is also at the forefront of conversation for the millennials, especially when this 20-something male asks the following question. Have you got a bash? No. <laughs> I've always known what I want. No. No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> she had dessert first, yeah, eh? Like I just love coffee. Though whatever your opinion, apparently it's normal behaviour for a millennial male. Well, that's what Adam told us. I think a, a young man asking another young female to have a pash is pretty much, a, that, that's like kosher. I mean, that's kind of what's going to happen at our age because, you know, when you're young, you're going to go out and if you ask a chick for a pash and she says no, you're just going to be like, oh, OK, sweet as, I'll find someone else to, you know, play with their tongue. As for the rest of our guinea pigs, let's just say opinion is divided. Jono's pash comment was um, embarrassing, actually. That's, I don't think, representative of our age group. I don't see a hell of a lot of that. I think boys in their 20s can get away with it. I mean, they did in my day. Yeah, I, don't, I thought that was um, a bit much. <laughs> then again, maybe we should blame the parents. Turns out this guy's father is none other than Alan Reeves, a.k.a. our driver from hell. He's been taught from an early age that you must knock on the door if you want it to open. And uh, so in life he does that, and uh, he was just asking for the order. But there's no denying the average millennial relates well to others, even if it does take a few glasses of wine. Oh, Darling, get that down here, because this is really fantastic wine. This is, Honestly, this have is... you ever met anybody that's actually good at I, drinking? I ain't no. driving, but hey. In other words, they're the total opposite to the baby boomers. No, but you think about it. What do you do when you get the horse? What do you do? Like, start a new life. Start a new life. Yeah. So what do you do? Go and live in a hotel. I thought the 40s dinner was strained. One of the guys mentioned he'd recently been separated. It's tough to be re-released. I think that the, the uh, 40s age group were probably a little bit more reserved, mainly because they were perhaps uh, more freshly out of relationships. Usually the been through a marriage or broken long-term romances and they're a bit fragile, so they're weary of other people. Though it seems once we reach our 60s, we suddenly have permission to be ourselves again. And, of course, drink a little too much at dinner parties. Cow! <laughs> no, I'm joking. Look at this excited. Look at this. Three, 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 three,
you Am I learning? You could, you You've got to be joking. Hello, we haven't seen you on your feet. Yeah, come, come on. That's right. Come on, oh, on your feet. Right. Turn turn on feet. feet. Rock and roll and jive. At the sixties dinner, I thought they enjoyed themselves. The, you know, you got the the guy in the red and um, Mr. Jazz Man. I loved them. I thought they were fantastic. Eh? Maybe they've reached the point where they just don't care what people think about them and they just want to have fun. Yeah, I actually found them the most interesting out of all of the age groups. Maybe a couple of things are going on. Perhaps it's that the, the end is nigh and they're going, I'm going to live it up as quickly as I can and as much as I can while I'm here. Maybe 60 really is the new 20 and the behaviours of the, the 60 something is reflecting what the 20 somethings are. But in general, you would have found that generation were far more conservative in terms of their approach to sex and dating in the early part of their life. And they're going, well, you know what? No one followed our rules or our moral frameworks. I want a piece of that action as well. So perhaps they're just getting a little bit back. Oh, my glasses. But scratch that liberal veneer and underneath beats the heart of a raving conservative. After all, if you're going to dress in red, have a ponytail at 63, you're just asking for trouble. Yeah. Should have been gay, really. It's just a bit funny. Strange that you're not. Sorry? Strange that you're not. What? Gay. Why would I want to be gay? Oh, dressed in all that red. But why would, why would you want to be gay? I don't know. I'm just saying that it's strange that you're not. No, no, it's just sort of... Uh, you don't have to be. We're not suggesting no, that no, you have sit to down, be. Peter. I thought that comment was really bold. A little bit of stereotyping, which you may expect. From, from that era? It's completely surprising from a six-year-old because six-year-olds, to me, are very conservative. I don't know. I'd probably say something like that. <laughs> so given we're all so different, one question really needs to be asked. Why do we date outside our generation? I mean, apart from the obvious, what's up with older men going out with younger women? From an instinctual point of view, older men look for someone not to challenge their position in life, to be physically able to bear their children, make them look good and keep them on their toes. Someone who they teach things, someone who adores and admires them, and someone who needs them. So, no surprises there. They need to get with a younger female. The new trend for an older female to get with a younger male is due to three profound influences. One, women have become increasingly independent, both financially and intellectually, a trait that today's 40 and 50 year old men find uncomfortable. Two, it's now much easier to find a successful, financially secure male in his 20s, i.e. super confident Gen Y. And three, women over 30 now tend to be physically fitter than most previous generations were at their age. Just ask any millennial male, he'll say a Gen X is hot. And speaking of intergenerational mixing, what happens when we get a millennial and a baby boomer to swap lives? I didn't even feed her. <laughs> I don't drink beer, but it'd be rude, wouldn't it, if I... Oh, it'd be rude. Age plays a big part in how we think, how we act and how we relate to other people, especially when we're in need of a quick pash. <laughs> <laughs> but what about our values? Are they also dictated by our age? To find out, we asked our guinea pigs to complete an online questionnaire designed to discover their attitude on everything from authority figures to same-sex marriages. Oh my god! Why did you ask me that? I think same-sex marriages fine. Do I mean do whatever you like. It's man and woman, that's my that's my uh, thoughts on the matter. So they need to find love in their life and if it's with the same uh, sex partner, good on them. And asking other pertinent questions, such as, do you trust the police? I don't trust the police because I've been arrested twice for unnecessary things. I trust the police totally. No, I don't trust the police. I'm almost beginning to doubt their integrity in some cases. And do you believe in God? Uh, I believe in keeping that to myself. <laughs> There is a supernatural power there. I'm not sure in what form. I do believe there is a God, but I'm not a practicing religious person. 
I was raised a Catholic. I would consider myself agnostic now. The online survey also contains several questions designed to tell us if our guinea pigs are actually telling the truth. Not that we don't trust every last one of these lovely people, it's just there's every chance they'll present an idealised view of themselves. And sure enough, according to the survey, 81% of them did. The silent generation lied the most, followed by the baby boomers, then the millennials, and least likely to lie were the Gen Xers. I would say the boomers will be all about maintaining the, you know, the status quo or the view that people have of them in the world. I think the millennials might you know, play themselves up a little bit more than they probably are because their confidence exceeds their competence. I think the X's, which are generally a more sceptical or perhaps even cynical bunch, probably won't give a toot what the rest of the world thinks and might be a little bit more abrupt and upfront and, and maybe even a little more honest. We have the silent generation who silently lies, who has been taught to keep quiet, to not speak their mind, but to say what is expected for them. So I suppose the question is, do we always lie? So do we actually lie uh, as much in our 50s as in 20s, or do we lie more in our 20s to actually make us appear differently? And I'd actually say that we probably always lie. Like, who doesn't? Um, it may well be that we lie for different reasons. Maybe we want, maybe we want to make ourselves look greater in our 20s, but maybe we want to hide things in our 60s. To be honest, I think we always lie. Which has us asking, what is the perfect age to finally stop pretending? Even in our 30s, 40s and 50s, we need to be like everyone else. Though having said that, each one of us has four distinct versions. Who we think we are, who we'd like to be, who others think we are and, of course, who we really are. In our 20s, we experiment with who we think we are. Then in our 30s and 40s, we spend a lot of time concerned with what others think. Whether it's our boss, partner, kids. By our 50s, we're focused on who we'd like to be and indulge a certain amount of wishful thinking along the lines of, I'd like to be nicer, taller and thinner. And while the other three of you are still there, by our 60s and 70s, they're very much in the background as we finally get to know who we really are. But white lies aside, it's said our personality is formed in early childhood and remains the same for the rest of our lives. The thing that constantly changes is our focus. But is the pattern more predictable than we think? To find out exactly how age determines what we think important, we've asked a baby boomer and a millennial to swap lives for three days. And who better to rise to this challenge than the extremely confident Adam Stevenson? Well, the truth is I'm, I'm quite excited, actually, because um, I guess it's um, like those um, little kid, uh, kids' games used to play when you used to dress up like a doctor and um, pretend that you were someone else for a day. What a relief, because he'll be swapping lives with a man who lets nothing stand in his way. Once again, meet Alan Reeves. I think Adam's in for a few challenges in the next few days. Uh, running the company company with a, a large group of single people is uh, often taxing. As Alan might find, taking on the existence of a musician, complete with four male flatmates and a fridge filled with nothing but beer. <laughs> G'day, guys. Hey, how you going, Kevin? All right, thanks. Hello, I'm oh, Michael. Nice to meet you. Hello, Michael. Pete. G'day. Hey, I'm Andrew. Andrew? I'm John. Nice John. to meet you. Nice to meet um, you. We've guys. got you a little flat woman gift, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink beer, but um, oh, it'd be rude, wouldn't it, if I... would be rude. I'd be offended. It'd be totally offended. Yeah, yeah. Not one to give up at the first hurdle. Just seconds later, Alan is chugging his first power skull. Thanks very much. Any other surprises? <laughs> And I think from that moment on that I actually finished that, even though there was probably a lot dripping down the sides of my mouth, I think I was accepted into the flat. And on that note, it's fair to ask, exactly how does age affect our idea of friendship? 20s is the period of our lives where we'll have the most friends. Though as we get older, the numbers begin to drop due to family, career, a change in interests. 
In fact, from 30 onward, many of our friendships are based on convenience and are the byproduct of work, sports, and who our kids choose to hang out with. Then, when we hit 65, suddenly friendships are important again and are based on closeness and shared experience. We also go back to thinking about who we are and what life is all about. And while Alan seems to be making new friends, Adam's only company is a very demanding poodle called Millie. And already our young millennial is struggling with the responsibility. How you going? Nice to meet you. Can you show me around? I've never thought about caring for a dog like it, as if I, I don't know, as if it was a, a human kind of thing. Like, I didn't, I've never really nurtured a pet. So I didn't even feed her. <laughs> Still haven't fed her. But the second you forced even a tiny little poodle on Adam to look after, it's just, just all too much, really, you know? The fact that he even lives out of home is a pretty good start for someone of his generation. Very, very nice. Wouldn't mind uh, ending up in a place like this when I was about 57. I just uh, hope Alan's um, enjoying going back to his younger days <laughs> at my house. <laughs> Actually, Alan's having a ball and is about to become the oldest member of Five Star Fallout. Have you ever been in a band before? Never. Never. Um, good, because you're in one now. As of today, we're having a band practice and really? you're going to be playing all Adam's parts. So I hope you can play the guitar and sing at the same time. No, I can't do either. Well, you better learn pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> things going through my mind when I was in that band practice was that here was Michael Murphy, the runner-up of New Zealand Idol, and, you know, um, and I was singing to, you know, as, as in a duet with him. And I thought, gosh, this is great. So I re really enjoyed that. Thanks. How does age affect our view of family, money, and relationships? I just don't like poodles. <laughs> Most of the time, the attitudes are a reflection of their age, of their generation, of their stage of life. <laughs> In asking a millennial and a baby boomer to swap lives for three days, we've made several important discoveries. From that moment on that I actually finished that, I think I was accepted into the flat. Can you show me upstairs? Millennials don't like taking responsibility, especially not for little dogs. <laughs> Still haven't fed her. And baby boomers want to be pop stars and have their five minutes of fame. Hey, look at me, I'm on TV, and I'm a baby boomer, so what else can you say? And as the experiment continues, the duo must also swap jobs, which for Alan means performing with the band in public, and for Adam, helping divorced baby boomers find love. Oh, hello, I'm Adam. <laughs> Adam. Changed your hairstyle? Yeah, slightly. I went for the younger look. When I thought about coming to work for Ellen's for company, the, the company company, um, I was like, shit, well, what are these kind of, uh, who are these people and, and why don't they have partners kind of thing? Welcome very, uh, very graciously, I guess, to this, uh, this Shaw Singles dinner. Um, I hear you guys do this uh, all the time and um, it looks like a, a great evening with, for everyone uh, involved. I think Adam leaving in Alan's life was a pretty good demonstration of the differences between generations. While intellectually, Adam understood divorce and he, half his friend's parents probably had their marriage end in similar ways, deep emotionally he couldn't understand why it was so damn hard to pick up. He would have just gone into your local nightclub and asked for a patch. Oh, sorry, I had a joke before. It's, it's gone now, don't worry. No, no, go on. Okay, okay, here's my joke. That's not a joke anymore. I just wanted to know who was single here. Yeah, a raise of hands, Pat. <laughs> oh, you're all sweet then. You don't need Francis's help. Meanwhile, Alan's singing debut is just 24 hours away. But rather than spend the time rehearsing, him and the boys have decided to have a party. So 
Something else Alan seems to have taken to is popping party pills and chatting up women in their 20s. And before long, he's disappeared from the party in the hope that he can persuade Adam's girlfriend to join the experiment. I think I've found them. <laughs> Hey, I've got them to the door. <laughs> I haven't quite got them to the do, do you want us to give you some privacy or...? And it seems this silver-tongued baby boomer has still got it. OK, let's sit up. <laughs> so, how does age change our view of relationships? For young adults, love is all about need, companionship and sexual satisfaction. Though from our 30s on, our definition becomes mutual affection and acceptance. Young adults also believe love is 51% passion, 29% intimacy and 20% commitment. While their older counterparts believe in a little less passion, a little bit more commitment, intimacy remains constant. But no matter what we think love is, it seems we're all quite keen to get in the game. Especially Especially the baby boomers, who are the most focused after years of putting their career first, they're keen to find love for the second or even third time. And typically they still view themselves as youthful, fit and above all, attractive. On the third and final day of our experiment, it seems Adam's finally grasping the concept of responsibility. Yeah, now you're getting the hang of it. Oh, come on Billy. Have you had a run-in with a staffie down the road, have you? What have you done? Why don't you want to go this way? Huh? Is this not the way Alan goes? Do we go the other way? I can't, I've, I've just got to take his advice. Her advice. I don't hate the dog, OK? I just don't like poodles. <laughs> And while Adam and his new best friend Millie are looking at a quiet, cosy night in by the telly, Alan is about to realise a dream. He's set to become a pop star. I can't sing, but I have to do this song. It's a great song. I want you to join with me. It's the exponents. Why does love do this to me? I believe the millennials are the living manifestation of everything the baby boomers wanted to be. They're carefree, you know, big go lucky, supremely confident, ready to take on the world. So when, when Alan went back into Adam's life, he really lived it up. I mean, he, in a way, it was as though he belonged and could have easily been his life 20 years before. So that kind of behaviour, I reckon you'd find that with other boomers would quite enjoy the millennial life as well. It's it is now that it's over. Though so before Alan steals the show, we have just one last question. How does age affect our focus on career? First is that initial commitment to vocation for crap money. Think Adam, think the band. Second is settle down and become established in the chosen field. Think money and kids that will suck it up. Third is the time when you regard yourself as experienced and knowledgeable. You're ready to consolidate your game. Think pay rise or I'm out of here. Fourth is the transitional period where goals have either been met or seem out of reach. The drive to achieve diminishes and the person begins to shift priorities as it gets closer to retirement time. And last is the time when you get out of active career life. Think holidays on cruise liners. Hope by this time you're rich. Or you could defy all the odds and become a pop star at 57. I don't know. Which brings us back to our original question. When it comes to attitude, what's the perfect age? There's really no perfect age for the perfect attitude. And most of the time, the attitudes are a reflection of their age, of their generation, of their stage of life. If you had to pick the perfect age for the best attitude, what age would it be? 
I think, all ages, actually. And every age has different life events and people at different ages respond to those appropriately and they have the skills to deal with that. I love the way the silence approached the dating game. I love the way Alan partied way harder than he probably did when he was 25 when he had a chance to live in Adam's life. Louise went nuts behind the wheel. She had a great time. And I like the eternal optimism of the millennials. There's nothing wrong with the age. I think, you know, you can have the perfect attitude at any age. But then again, attitude is only one piece of the puzzle. And next week we ask, what is the perfect age when it comes to brain power? How age affects our attitude to technology. And it all came down to just rebooting it. <laughs> Through to our emotional intelligence. That's next time on The Perfect Age. Well, I used to be a total loser, and then I got my PT Cruiser. Now all the girls want me to take them home. 